Welcome back to Judgment Decision Making. I'm Dr. Padilla. Now we're going to talk about reasoning and moral decision making. Our first question is what is morality? Do we mostly think or feel our way to deciding what is right? Is morality new or rooted in older primate legacy? What cultural environmental factors influence morality? These are the high level questions that we're going to address in the next three lectures. Cognitive processes that we bring to moral reasoning aren't perfect. In that, there are fault lines of vulnerability, imbalances, and asymmetries. One new example from the book suggests that we think that doing harm is worse than allowing someone else to do harm. And there's research that suggests if you are asked to imagine that doing harm is the same as allowing someone to do harm that actually activates part of the brain associated with emotional control. Generally, you can think of it as if someone commits murder, we feel like that is worse than someone allowing another individual to commit murder, even though same person dies. And that's a real strong example of how the outcome is the same, but the way we think about the context is different. Another example is that we're better at deciding violation of social contracts that have malevolent rather than benevolent consequences. You can think of this as a social contract where you're either um, violating the contract because you're giving too little, such as giving someone toilet paper for an anniversary or giving too much, like giving someone a car for the anniversary. We're really attuned to identifying when you're giving too little rather than too much even though it's the same distance from the right social action. Another interesting example from the book is with this particular scenario. So in this experiment, participants were told that a worker was giving this information to a boss. If we do this, there will be big profits and we will harm the environment in the process. And the boss responds, I don't care about the environment, just do it. Now a different group was shown this scenario where a worker says, if we do this, there will be big profits and will benefit the environment in the process and the boss still responds i don't care about the environment just do it now of course the boss's response is exactly the same in these two scenarios so we can assume that the boss's motivation is the same however subjects stated that the boss harmed the environment in order to increase profits in the first example 85% of the time and only 23% of the time in the second scenario, suggesting that people believed that the boss was a better actor in the second scenario, even though the boss's actions were identical in both scenarios. Again, just many examples of how our decision-making process isn't entirely rational in a computational way. It's biased based on our environment and our context and our cognitive processes. Is morality actually anchored in reasoning? We've learned that people often do not have a clue why they made a decision, yet they fervently believe that it is correct. When contemplating moral decisions, we don't just activate the DLPFC, there's also activation of emotional centers. When faced with a moral quandary, there's activation of the amygdala, the VMPFC, and the insula, and this typically precedes the activation of the DLPFC. And the, that essentially means that all of these areas associated with emotion are being activated more quickly in response to information than the areas associated with rational control decision making. So we make emotional response even before our um, more contemplative part of the brain has a chance to include itself in the decision-making process. Damage to the emotional brain regions make moral judgments more uh, pragmatic, even cold-hearted. For example, people with the damage to the emotional area readily advocate for sacrificing one relative to save five strangers, something the control subjects would never do. Sometimes we have strong moral opinions, but we can't tell why we have those opinions. For example, this was from a few lectures ago, people become more conservative in their social judgments when they smell a foul odor in the room or if they're sitting at a dirty desk. Just the smell of the environment can influence your decisions and you are unaware that that's happening. And also note that there's some individuals that have a stronger 
guttural, visceral response to information. So they're more likely to have this disgust type of emotion towards things that are scary that they don't like. And I'll also bring up this um, finding that we talked about in the very beginning of the class where positive court rulings drop off significantly right before lunch, indicating that judges are being highly influenced by if they're hungry or not. Now, what I wanna talk about is how do we know if these types of moral decision-making responses are innate to humans and when they develop? Some evidence that we can get for the early development of these um, immediate emotional responses comes from work with infants and children. I'm gonna play you a short clip. Basically, we test for this by showing infants a series of puppet shows. Um, so we have, um, say, three puppets. One puppet will have a particular goal. Um, maybe he wants to climb a hill or pick up a dropped object or open a box. And in alternation, we'll show them little events in which one puppet will help the guy get his goal, so get him to the top of the hill or open a box, and the other puppet will prevent the guy from getting his goal. Um, so he'll take his ball away or push him down the hill or something like that. And infants will watch these uh, events in alternations. We call them helper events and hinderer events. Of course, we always vary the color and the side and the order in which infants see these events. And afterward, um, an experimenter who wasn't there to observe which puppet did what that day will bring the two puppets over um, and ask them to choose one. And so we've now done this um, with hundreds of infants in many different iterations of versions of helping and hindering and found that um, over 80%, um, usually, you know, even as much as 100% of babies in a given study will always pick the nice one. So they like the helper puppets over the hinderer puppets. Um, and we found this as early as three months of age, um, sort of just when they're starting to socially smile and sort of um, uh, uh, even hold their head up, you know, they're still sleeping most of the time at that age, um, and yet they're already distinguishing the good guys from the bad guys. What I think this says about the human mind is that um, the ability to distinguish those who want to help us versus those who want to harm us is something um, that's been laid down sort of in the design of our minds. Um, developmental psychologists and educational psychologists have focused a lot on the role of varying experience in moral outcomes. So what makes a kid a bully? What makes a kid end up in juvie? What makes them um, end up being uh, you know, a caring Canadian? I think that if we consider children as just sort of moral blank slates or sort of that all of these different things are based on varying experiences, that we might be painting the wrong developmental picture. Really interesting work, of course. And I, what I'd like to point out is that these children are so young, they haven't had time to learn what is morally right or not, but it's sort of ingrained into the way that they think about the world, even from a very, very young age. Now let's look at an example with animals who we can assume haven't developed our same cultural um, persuasions toward morality that we have. So a final experiment that I wanna to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, this, this became a very famous study and there's now many more because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys and uh, I'm gonna show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs and with birds and with chimpanzees, um, with, but with Sarah Brosnan we started out with capuchin monkeys. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber <laughs> is perfectly fine for them. Now, if you give the partner grapes, the, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes, it's a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, uh, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left 
is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. She tests the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. <laughs> so this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. Really interesting work. What it demonstrates to us is that morality isn't unique to humans. It's shared by a wide range of other species as well. And what this is suggesting is that the roots of human morality are older than our cultural institutions, our laws, and our sermons. The cognitive processes we bring to morality aren't perfect. We have vulnerabilities, imbalances, and asymmetries. This is really the whole point of this course, and I hope that you can understand that very easily at this point. Finally, is morality actually anchored in reasoning? We could say not fully. There are some reasoning processes that play into it, but there are so many unconscious, both physiological and um, environmental factors that play into how we understand morality.